Welcome to the Monument Health Cancer Care Institute's Oncology Clinical Pearl Sessions. I'm your host, Nathan Matlock. I am the current PGY2 Oncology Pharmacy Resident at Monument Health Rapid City Cancer Care Institute. Today, we're going to be talking about the recommendations for the use of granulocyte colony stimulating factor, or GCSF, agents. So let's get at it. So I think it's best to start with a little bit of background. Um, so neutropenia, that is simply a decrease in the absolute neutrophil count, an ANC. So why is a decrease in neutrophils uh, important? Uh, they are critical in providing host defense against infections. Uh, so those can be bacterial or fungal infections. So the rate of infection actually increases with more profound and more prolonged neutropenia events. So thinking about neutropenia, it occurs in approximately 25 to 30 percent of patients and has an approximate 11 percent mortality rate. Um, in the setting of a severe sepsis event or a septic shock event, uh, hospital mortality is approximately 50 percent, uh, so one out of two. Uh, so thinking about our G GCSF agents, they're utilized to reduce the duration and the severity of neutropenia and the risk of febrile neutropenia. So this enables GCSF agents. They also enable a patient to better tolerate more intensive or more dose dense chemotherapy if they actually are indicated for such regimens. So we also have three main bodies that describe febrile neutropenia and GCSF use. Um, they are the American Society of Clinical Oncology or ASCO, Infectious Diseases Society of America, IDSA, and then of course, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN. Continuing with a few more background items, defining what neutropenia is and their, its levels. Uh, so general neutropenia, A and C less than 1,000. Severe neutropenia, A and C less than 500. Profound neutropenia, A and C less than 100. And then prolonged neutropenia is any neutropenia event lasting longer than seven days. So fever is also defined. Uh, a single oral temperature of greater than or equal to 38.3 degrees Celsius or 101 Fahrenheit. Now, or if it's great, your temperature is greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius, 100.4 Fahrenheit, sustained over one hour. So why is fever important? Um, so when evaluating this patient group, it's important to remember that due to decreased neutrophils, the typical signs of infection may not be present. So the, the attenuation makes it critical for the evaluation if the patient is febrile or not. So this would be our only sign of infection. So kind of thinking about our uh, Monument Health critical uh, CCI, uh, what uh, do we tell our patients about when to present to the ED? So uh, kind of six points. Uh, if uh, oral fever is greater than 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, above 100 or above 100 degrees Fahrenheit for three consecutive days, or shaking chills, go to the ED. New onset of burning or pain or blood when passing urine new onset of shortness of breath or painful breathing, soreness or swelling in the oral cavity, ulcers or white patches in the mouth or throat, redness, pain, purulence, or swelling of the skin, especially around things like an IV site, a J-tube, or a catheter, making sure they get to the ED at those points. I think before we get into the recommendations on GCSF agent use and recommendations, I think we need to talk about febrile neutropenia um, and the uh, different guideline recommendations. So ASCO guidelines, uh, they do have specific recommendations for febrile neutropenia. The number one item is that um, in absence of alter alternative explanation, uh, it should be assumed that a fever is in neutropenic patient is the result of an inf infection. So we want to get things like the CBC with diff, a CMP, uh, get blood cultures, get those two sets. Uh, you want to make sure you get a peripheral set plus your uh, central venous catheter if present or any other sites that may be indicated. Uh, of course, imaging, your chest imaging with signs and symptoms of lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, if they are presenting with the influenza-like illness, getting your na nasopharyngeal swab. So thinking about antibiotics, um, Empiric within one hour after triage of presentation. So get these on quickly. Uh, monotherapy with anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam, so cefepime, carbapenem, or piptazo, uh, can add aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones or even vancomycin if indicated. Uh, point here, vancomycin is not recommended as a standard part of empiric coverage. 
However, it should be considered for catheter-related infections, skin soft tissue infections, pneumonia, or any hemodynamic instability that may be present. So the ASCO guideline point two, um, candidates for outpatient management. Um, this is where we're gonna try to decide if a patient needs to be kept inpatient or if they can be managed outpatient. Uh, there are some tools we can use. Um, I do have tables uh, from the guidelines. Um, and then, so you see table one in the guidelines, mask index score, see table two in the guidelines. Uh, also have it included on the next slide. You have Talcott's rules, uh, table three in the guidelines, and then the CISNY score, which is in table four of the guidelines. Um, so if they're infected with fourquinolone resistant gram negative pathogens, uh, plus co-resistant to beta lactams or cephalosporins, you're going to treat these as uh, inpatients, uh, and you're going to specifically treat them with a carbapenem-based regimen uh, that likely requires multiple doses per day. Uh, so if it's suspected MRSA, VRE, or stenotrophomonas, um, you should be considering these as inpatient management as well. Uh, so if patients are also undergoing uh, stem cell transplant or induction therapy for acute leukemia, um, they are likely to not be managed in the outpatient setting either. So this, as I mentioned, is the MASS score. Um, it is a scoring system used to identify patients with cancer and febrile neutropenia that will be or should be at a low risk of medical complications. So the Multinational Association for Supportive Care and Cancer, or the MASK Risk Index, is a validated tool for measuring the risk of neutropenic fever-related medical complications. The MASK score has correctly classified low and high-risk patients in 98 and 86% of cases, respectively. The MAC score is a 26, and a score of greater than or equal to 21 predicts patients at low risk for serious complications. These patients may be treated safely as outpatients. So a retrospective cohort study suggested that a mean C-reactive protein, or CRP, concentration of greater than 150 milligrams per liter, together with a high-risk mass score, is associated with a higher risk of 30-day all-cause mortality than a high-risk mass score and a mean CRP concentration less than 150 milligrams per liter. So thinking about criticisms uh, possibly of the mass score, uh, one criticism is that the lack of standardized definition of the criteria burden of febrile neutropenia, which might be confusing or interpreted differently by different clinicians. Another important point is that the mask risk index does not include duration of neutropenia as a criteria, although it, this is considered an important predictor of risk. Another criticism is that the mask risk index was developed using, using heterogeneous population and that it may not perform optimally in all populations. An example is a retrospective study of outpatients with solid tumors who appeared to be clinically stable. The mass risk index had a low sensitivity to detect complications in 36%. The low sensitivity was likely to be due to the fact that the patients were all outpatients and the rates of hypotension, dehydration, and invasive fungal infections were low. Thus, only three criteria were present to make a prognostic distinction. Um, the serious complications predicted by the mass score are um, hypotension, uh, so it's just systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, or the need for impressor support. Uh, respiratory failure, admit to critical care, DIC, AMS, or so alter mental status, and development of congestive heart uh, cardiac failure or arrhythmia. So additional things that could be considered when deciding outpatient management, uh, these all should be considered. Uh, your psychosocial and logistic considerations for their management. So if they're a long way away uh, from a clinic or a hospital, so less than um, or greater than or equal to an hour or greater than 30 miles away, uh, probably want to keep them inpatient. Uh, if their PCP or oncologist agrees with outpatient management, that'll, it needs to be a team effort. So compliance with logistics, uh, are they going to be able to make frequent visits to the clinic? Uh, family member or caregiver present? Um, do they have someone that can care for them 24-7 um, until this is resolved? Do they have access to a telephone readily? Uh, additional recommendations, at least three days of evaluation at home or in a clinic uh, after presentation. Daily frequent telephone contact. 
uh, monitoring of ANC and platelets for myeloid uh, reconstitution. Um, and then admission on uh, presentation of any new signs or symptoms. So making sure these patients get back to the hospital or clinic, uh, or if there's no change in symptoms after three days of empiric antibiotic coverage. So point four and five, uh, very similar. <clears throat> Neutropenic fever and outpatient management of initial antibiotic dose. Uh, like I said, first dose, you want to make sure you get it administered in the clinic or the hospital. So get that empiric dose soon, uh, within one hour of triage. Um, you want to make sure you observe the patient for greater than or equal to four hours prior to discharging them. And then patients with febrile neutropenia and low risk of medical complications, uh, or fever is responding to inpatient empiric antibiotics, and they're clinically stable. Uh, they could be eligible for a transition to an outpatient management. Uh, then your antimicrobials, 0.5, uh, the recommendations uh, for empiric outpatient management. Uh, you're looking at a fluoroquinolone, uh, specifically ciprofloxacin uh, for our facility, and then plus or minus a moxiclav, uh, clavulonate, uh, or you can go with uh, clindamycin if they have an allergy. Uh, so a couple points um, about or a point about fluoroquinolones. Um, as monotherapy and empiric treatment is not recommended, some studies have shown that they may be effective and low risk. Um, similar level of safety and efficacy uh, with oral versus IV regimens as your initial empiric therapy and outpatient management. And then IV is widely available, but PO agents are more convenient, less costly, and preferred by many patients and clinicians to treat low risk febrile neutropenia uh, in the outpatient settings. So ASCO's six point in febrile neutropenia management. Um, so low risk patients that do not improve after those that two to three day mark of empiric outpatient therapy, we need to get those patients reevaluated and trying to detect and treat for new or progressing anatomic site of infections. Uh, we need to consider for hospi hospitalization if any of the following, so fever recurrence after a period of no improvement, uh, they have new signs or symptoms of infection, uh, use of an oral no longer tolerated or possible, uh, and then cultures taken uh, result as positive and not susceptible, susceptible to the prescribed regimen. All of those individuals, we need to make sure we get them back in-house um, and, and take care of them. Now we're going to move to uh, the guideline recommendations for use of GCSF agents. So I included these uh, because they are not necessarily an inpatient side of things, but they are primary and secondary prophylaxis. So what they would receive um, after their chemotherapy regimen, um, or if they were added on to subsequent chemotherapy regimens due to a neutropenic event after the first regimen was given. Uh, so primary, again, starting with the first cycle and continuing through the subsequent cycles for chemotherapy is recommended in patients who have approximately 20% or higher risk of febrile neutropenia based on patient or disease and treatment related factors. Interesting point about this, uh, due to the COVID-19 infection uh, and uh, pandemic that's occurring, um, they have recommended dropping this to 10% and post to that 20% mark. Uh, we need to make sure it should be administered in patients receiving dose-dense chemotherapy uh, when it's considered appropriate, and consideration given to alternative, equally effective, and safe chemotherapy re regimens not requiring GCSF when it's available. And then, like I said, secondary prophylaxis recommended for patients who experienced a neutropenic complication from a prior cycle of chemotherapy and primary prophylaxis was not received in which a reduced dose or treatment delay may compromise that disease-free survival or overall survival uh, treatment outcome. So this is ASCO's guideline recommendations for treatment uh, utilizing GCSF agents. Um, if they are inpatient. Uh, so it, they make a few statements here. So GCSF should not routinely be utilized in patients that are afebrile. So if they are do not have a temperature, uh, do we do not use to be using these routinely. GCSF agents should not be routinely used as adjuvant treatment with antibiotic therapy for patients with fever and neutropenia. So Stipulation on this is we need to consider if febrile plus neutropenia plus high risk for infection associated complications or that have prognostic factors predictive of poor clinical outcomes, then we can utilize uh, GCSF agents. 
So agents that we could probably uh, see are Phil Grastum, uh, the TBO Phil Grastum, and Phil Grastum SNDZ, uh, the biosimilar, uh, can be used for the treatment of neutropenia. Really, the choice here comes down to um, what is convenient, what's the best cost, and what is the clinical situation of the patient. Uh, so a 2014 meta-analysis showed that a treatment uh, that the treatment of febrile neutropenia with antibiotics plus a GCSF did not reduce overall mortality compared with antibiotics alone. Uh, so, however, the addition of a GCSA event did shorten the duration of neutropenia, fever, and antibiotic use and reduced the number of hospital days that were greater than 10 days. Currently, dosing is set at 5 micrograms per kilogram per day. However, patients can receive a 300 microgram or a 480 milligram or microgram uh, dose due to vial size availability. This results in the common practice of suboptimally dosing patients uh, based on their weight. So high risk uh, for infection associated complications and poor clinical outcomes um, are going to be described on the next slide. So here in this chart, it describes patient risk factors for poor clinical outcomes resulting from febrile uh, neutropenia or infection and helps to direct toward if a patient would benefit from GCSF support. Uh, on the left side, you can see features of high risk infection. Um, all of those are listed. And then on the right side, you can see patient risk factors for poor clinical outcomes resulting from febrile neutropenia or infection. So now we're moving away from the ASCO recommendations to the IDSA guideline recommendations. Um, here, they're very similar. These go hand in hand. Um, IDSA, or IDSA pretty much points straight back to ASCO for their recommendations. Um, so here, two points. Uh, prophylactic use of myeloid colony stimulating factors should be considered for patients in whom the anticipated risk of fever and neutropenia is greater than or equal to 10% or 20%. And like I said, uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, that has actually been dropped down to 10% in, in specific patient populations. So GCSF agents are not generally recommended for treatment of established fever and neutropenia. Again, here they say see ASCO guidelines. Uh, they were co-developed um, and that's why they point back. Now we've moved on from that set of gu guideline recommendations. Now we're going to look at NCCN guideline recommendations. On, this is specifically for the prophylaxis. Again, uh, not inpatient. These are, again, if the patient experienced an episode of febrile neutropenia or dose limiting neutropenic event during the previous uh, treatment cycle with the same dose and schedule plan for the current cycle and patient had not received prior GCF support. Um, prophylactic uh, GCF uh, SF agent uh, should be considered since the patient would now be considered high risk. And if the patient did not develop a febrile neutropenic or dose limiting neutropenic event, the first cycle, uh, each subsequent uh, cycle, the patient should be monitored uh, for risk and benefit of GCSF use. Again, not applying to the inpatient, uh, specifically more for treat, uh, the regimen development on the front end. So now we're moving into the NCCN uh, treatment recommendation. So these are the RN patient guys. Uh, there is a clinical benefit, but remains unclear if these benefits translate to a survival advantage. Um, patients presenting with febrile neutropenia who are receiving or have received GCSF should continue to receive the GCSF agent. Um, pegylated formulations received prophylactically should not be treated with additional GCSF. Uh, a little sub bullet uh, here, there are no studies that address the use of non-pegylated formulations in patients that received a pegylated form. Pegylation, just take, making it last longer uh, in the body, so it's got an extended duration. Uh, can consider GCSF support and prolonged neutropenia. Uh, so if these individuals um, extend beyond that 12 to 14 day mark, uh, then that pegylated form is wearing off and we could probably add on uh, the immediate acting. Uh, so their second big uh, division here is patients presenting with febrile neutropenia who have not received prophylactic GCSF. So we want to evaluate the risk factors. Uh, so again, seeing those previous uh, tables that are in the slide uh, and evaluating those. Uh, and then looking at age greater than 65, 
uh, profound neutropenia. So profound, again, remember, is uh, less than 100. Uh, pro, uh, prolonged neutropenia here, they're saying greater than 10 days, so that greater than 7 to 10 day mark. Um, do they have pneumonia? Uh, do they have an invasive fungal infection? Uh, is the hospitalization required at the time of fever uh, or acquired at the time of fever? And then prior episode of febrile neutropenia in their medical history. So here uh, are risk and benefits of GCSF. Uh, nothing is completely benign, um, so we always have to consider the risk and benefits. So a couple of the big ones I want to point out, uh, bone pain. Uh, it's major and the most consistently observed adverse event, mild to moderate in about 10 to 30 percent of patients. To help treat this and actually help this, uh, loratadine, 10 milligrams uh, by mouth for about five excuse me, five to seven days uh, after the administration of a GCSF agent. NSAIDs are typically not an option for these patients receiving chemotherapy due to that uh, renal impairment. Uh, most likely that's occurring or could be occurring. Um, thinking about splenic rupture, uh, it is rare, uh, but some were fatal. Uh, it uh, typically occurs in patients with underlying hematopoietic, hematopoietic uh, disorders uh, or solid tumors. And it's thought to be due to an intrasplenic accumulation of circulating granulocytes and myeloid precursors. Um, so really looking for that left upper quadrant pain, uh, nausea, vomiting, and worsening anemia uh, that can be a sign of uh, splenic ruptures on the way. Um, and then thinking about bleomycin-induced pulmonary toxicity. Uh, what regimen has the patient been on? What have they received? Um, so 26% versus 9% uh, development in patients that received GCSF with bleomycin versus those that did not. Uh, so very serious here. AML and MDS not observed in individual randomized trials, um, only in epidemiologic studies. Uh, Meta-analysis um, unable to determine if, the, uh, if it was due to a GCSF uh, or uh, the cumulative doses of prior chemotherapy. Uh, overall mortality was shown to be decreased in the patients that received GCSF. So I want to talk a little bit about the drugs on the next couple slides. Um, so filgrastim or nupagen, and then you have the biosimilar Zarzio. Uh, your dosing, uh, five mics, uh, five micrograms per kilogram per day. Uh, doses may be increased by five micrograms per kilogram. Uh, for each uh, chemotherapy cycle according to the duration and severity of the neutropenia. Uh, this has no renal or hepatic dose adjustments. Your typical onset of action is going to be around one to two days, and it may last for up to 14 days for the duration. Um, and then so until the, and you want to make sure you continue this agent until the ANC reaches two to three. Um, and then typically counts return to baseline within about four days. So the mechanism of action here, it's a granulocyte colony stimulating factor that stimulates the production, maturation, and activation of neutrophils to increase both their uh, migration and cytotoxicity. Filgrastim is internalized and degraded by your neutrophils and are renally eliminated. So uh, if you have a patient and their ANC is, let's say, zero, um, and if they are, um, you're giving them filgrastim and there are no neutrophils to take it in, the agent will actually still be there uh, because it can't be internalized if there is no neutrophil there. So that's something to remember. Um, so always think about filgrastim is internalized and then in degraded by the neutrophils and a small portion is renally eliminated. So this is our PEG filgrastim, Nulasta or the Nulasta on Pro. And then you have Udenica, biosimilar, and then Z Extensio, which is another biosimilar agent. The dosing here, six milligrams once per chemotherapy cycle, at least 24 hours after completion of uh, chemotherapy, um, and then not uh, after uh, 14 days prior to and 24 hours after administration of the next cycle. So again, no renal or hepatic dose adjustments. Um, you do have prolonged effects relative to that filgrastim. Uh, the duration of effect is a lot longer to that pegylated effect. So again, mechanism of action is the same. Uh, again, filgrastim internalized, degraded by your neutrophils. That pegylation prevents the renal clearance. Uh, this keeps the agent in the body longer. Uh, another point to remember in thinking about inpatient, uh, this will not typically be used in the inpatient setting uh, for treatment. 
Uh, these have really only been studied uh, for prophylactic use and are not recommended uh, for inpatient at this time. And that's back to those NCCN recommendations. And again, pegylation should not be used in infants, children, or small adolescents who weigh less than 45 kilograms. So CCI um, and the pharmacist and providers uh, at Monument Health, uh, there is a new BPA that went live. It's the GCSF uh, BPA went live on September 1st of 2021. Uh, it triggers on a new order for GCF uh, agents, so filgrastim or peg filgrastim. And if the patient has received a GCS agent in the previous 10 days in any account encounter, uh, it'll also uh, trigger during pharmacist verification. So not only order entry, but as well as when they're going through their verification stages. So the goal uh, here is to reduce the inappropriate duplication of therapy during transitions of care, specifically, for example, outpatient to inpatient. So they've came to CCI, they've gotten their uh, therapy. So let's say a filgrastim uh, uh, on, I mean, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, an, uh, new on pro, and uh, they prevent back to the ED uh, and then need to go inpatient. Uh, so this is where that would be very important. Uh, we want to assist uh, providers and pharmacists to determine whether additional doses are even clinically appropriate at that time. Um, so to do uh, here, so provider or pharmacist must select the remove or keep function. Uh, and this is going to either delete it or keep the order. And then if you keep it, you want to make sure you select the reason. And we're going to see that on the next slide, kind of what it looks like. So here's the GCSF BPA that was created and what it looks like kind of in real time, what you'll be seeing. Um, again, here you can see that um, the date and time uh, Peg Phil Graston was given. Uh, you can see here the agent, the dose, and then what do you want to do? Uh, you can see at the top it says they have had the GCSF agent uh, administered in the last 10 days, going through the what time, when, and where. Um, what do you want to do? Do you want to remove it? Do you want to keep it? Um, and then most of the time you're going to click remove uh, and then you're going to acknowledge uh, what for what reasons. Uh, so yeah, then you just want to make sure you accept it. So part of this project was an MUE of our inpatient use of Phil Graston. Uh, we reviewed a total of 19 inpatients and there were a total of 18 occurrences of neutropenia with seven of those being diagnosed as febrile neutropenia. Uh, one patient had autoimmune neutropenia. So our median age uh, was 62 years of age. Our average weight was 82 kilograms and our average BSA was 1.94 meters squared. Um, retrospective calculation of the seven uh, febrile neutropenic patients, their mass score uh, resulted in one patient with a score of 13, one patient with a score of 18, four patients with a score of 19, and one patient with a score of 21. There were a total of 52 inpatient administrations of GCSF agent, uh, so you're filgrastin between June 1st of 2021 and December 1st of 2021. Um, these were composed of nine doses of 300 micrograms, 39 doses of 480 microgram, three doses of 600 microgram, and one dose of 780 microgram. One dose was inappropriate. Um, so indications of a GCSF uh, included seven for febrile neutropenia, 10 for neutropenia, and one for severe neutropenia. So kind of looking at the cost on these, uh, just thinking about this real quick, um, a single dose of the uh, 300 microgram is $139.10, while the 480 microgram is $222.52. So thinking about our previous slide uh, and their doses that were given, um, Really, Dr. Elslade uh, et al. Uh, reviewed 91 patients that were divided into three subgroups. Um, low weight, less than 60 kilograms, medium weight, greater than or equal to 60 and less than 85 kilograms, and then uh, high weight, greater than or equal to 85 kilograms. Uh, overall, it was shown that in patients less than 85 kilograms, it was efficacious to use the suboptimal dose of 300 microgram, so a flat dose. Uh, and these are some of the results in this table here that point this out. Uh, you can see uh, very, very little um, in between that um, middle and low weight. 
Uh, the study was presented at the 2018 N, uh, NCCN annual conference. Uh, it was found that infections, delays in chemotherapy, and hospitalizations due to chemotherapy related uh, febrile neutropenia were very low, so 5%. Patients in the medium weight group, uh, they did not have higher rates of infection. Uh, patients in the high weight group did experience a higher rate of infection, uh, so 5% uh, versus 33%, which was sig sig uh, statistically significant. Uh, currently, dosing is 5 micrograms per kilogram per day. However, patients can receive 300 microgram or 400 microgram dose due to uh, vial size availability. Um, again, this can result in the common practice of suboptimally dosing a patient. I did reach out uh, to a couple of other institutions to find out what their practices were. Uh, one institute uh, utilized a fixed dose for both uh, prophylaxis and treatment docents. Uh, patients weighing less than uh, 78 kilograms get or received a 300 microgram dose. And if they were greater than 78 kilograms, they got a, a 480 milligram microgram dose. Um, the second institution utilized uh, a 5 microgram uh, per kilogram day per day dosing with vial rounding to either a 300 microgram or 480 microgram dose. The only time a dose utilized greater than uh, 480 micrograms is basically for a bone marrow tra uh, transplant mobilization, but never really for a prophylaxis or a treatment dose. And if you think back to our uh, results, we had um, some 600 microgram doses and one um, 780 microgram dose. Uh, and then so if you think about this, 13 of the 480 microgram doses that were administered uh, inpatient could have technically been moved to 300 microgram doses based on body weight less than or equal to 84 kilograms for a total cost savings of approximately $1,084.98. And this is the references uh, I utilized. And then questions. Uh, I know it's recorded. Um, you can't ask questions live. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please reach out uh, my email right now, nmatlock uh, at monument.health. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we can talk about it, discuss, and answer, get any questions that you may have answered. Um, so that's it for today, guys. I appreciate y'all, and I look forward to seeing y'all the next time. Y'all have a good one.